My pleasure and honor to present today the debate on Austrian economics between two prominent members of our economics department. I'm sure everybody is familiar with the topic, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So let's just get started. I'd just like to thank the Economics Club for setting this up. It's been a lot of work. Now, just to begin with, Peter Betke and I agree about so many things in economics, you may wonder what the point of a debate between us is in the first place. So just to begin with some of the things that we agree on, uh, for one thing, see we're in almost perfect agreement about desirable economic policy. Now, there is a stereotype about economics that they are all doctrinaire free marketeers. The stereotype is false, right? But in this case, we are the exceptions to the rule because it is actually true about us. Right? Both of us would like to see sweeping libertarian reforms. Uh, so in any case, so very often when you hear people arguing about seemingly incomprehensible abstract topics, it is actually a mask for a political disagreement. That's not true here. Right? That is not true here. We agree so much about political philosophy that it would be rather odd for this to actually be a covert philosophical or a, a political philosophical discussion. Right now, another thing that Pete and I agree about is that the economic profession grossly overrates the value of mathematical modeling and econometrics. So I say that we can agree about this as well. Right. Now, I, I think both of us could say that they have their uses, right? but nevertheless, that these techniques have wound up becoming an end in themselves, right? where it's much more important to be a good mathematical modeler, to be good at econometrics, than to have anything much to say about economics. Right. And moreover, they've crowded out a lot of other valuable techniques. Right. So they've crowded out economic history, surveys, interviews, introspection. Okay. So Pete and I can agree about that. Now, and, and last but not least, something else that Pete and I agree about is that most of our fellow economists are boring. <laughs> they are, I think that we can, well, Pete may not be so comfortable saying it, but I know that he believes it. <laughs> so I'd say that you have, to, <laughs> you have thousands of PhDs spending their lives working on questions where even if they got the answer, who would really care? And you could take a look at top journals in economics. There's only a small fraction of the questions where once they were answered, you would feel like you would actually learn something important about the world. It does take great technical ability to get into the best journals. However, it often does not take any great insight about the world or the economy in order to do so. All right, so if we can agree on these three things, what is left? I mean, what is there actually left to dispute? Well, see, the answer may be a little bit hard to believe, right, but I, I assure you that it's true. The answer is that we disagree about certain abstract questions in basic economic theory which, uh, again, may be a little puzzling. Well, that is actually the disagreement. Right? It is none of these other things. Right? Now, essentially, in each of these cases, I maintain that the orthodox neoclassical position, correctly understood, right, is correct, and that the Austrian critics are wrong. Right? Now, before I begin, I should say that Austrians don't just disagree with me, they also disagree with each other. Right? So, we, I'm going to have to apologize in advance to all of the anti betke Austrians out there right, because I'm, I'm going to be attacking a position I refer to as the Austrian view. You may substitute that in your mind for Betke's Austrian view. If you feel that your own views have not been in any way touched, but uh, if you merely want to say that Betke is not the true Austrian, I will let you fight that out among yourselves. So I will be just criticizing the Betke version of Austrian economics. Let's we'll focus on him. Right now, this is going to be this is a bit of a challenge because at least sometimes Pete will describe Austrian economics in such a way that's so vague that almost anyone could be an Austrian economist. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is good. Yeah. So, so for example, people tell you that Austrians are subjectivists. Right? And what does subjectivists believe? Subjectivists believe that values and beliefs are in the minds of human beings in contrast to other people who think that beliefs and values are in, say, camcorders, something like that. Okay, now, my point here is that every mainstream textbook will say exactly the same thing, that yes, beliefs, are, beliefs and values are in the minds of individuals. Right now, Betke does have a response to this. Right, he's going to tell you, yes, well, yeah, it's true, mainstream economists are subjectivists. However, we are radical subjectivists. Right, we are radical subjectivists. Right now, I mean, in all honesty, I have to say I'm still very puzzled as to what the difference is. The only one that I've seen empirically is that radical subjectivists use the word subjectivism a lot, and regular subjectivists do not. Right? So regular subjectivists take it for granted that beliefs and values are in the minds of individuals, and radical subjectivists are always telling you, hey, these beliefs and values are in the minds of individuals. Okay? 
so in any case, um, we can talk about that more in the Q&A, right? But at least when, when Betkey says things like this, it's fairly hard to criticize in the sense that he's saying, he's saying things are Austrian that almost all economists think, right? But there is one big area where Betkey defends specific views that most other economists, and that includes me, do not accept, right? And that area is information economics. The area is information economics. Right now, if you go to your very simplest neoclassical models from a textbook, they'll make an assumption that would seem bizarre correctly to any normal person. The assumption is everyone has perfect knowledge of the world. Right now, is there anyone here who has perfect knowledge of the world? <laughs> Alex. <laughs> right, so in, in any case, this seems like a very odd assumption to make, right, or a rather extreme one. Right now, uh, at once uh, economists begin realizing that there's a problem with this, and I'd say they always knew there was a problem with it, Rather, it was used as a simplifying assumption, but once they noticed that they should think about this, think this, think this through to a greater extent, uh, a neoclassical economist said, well, we can resolve this issue using probability theory. We can resolve this issue using probability theory. Right? So what we're going to assume is that people implicitly assign probabilities right, or degrees of confidence, probabilities or degrees of confidence to, to, to different events. Right? And these probabilities range from a probability of zero Right, which in ordinary language is impossible. If there's any math major in the room, you'll know I've said something slightly wrong, but uh, in any case, in common sense terms, a an event with a probability of zero is impossible, and on the other hand, an event with a probability of one is certain, and your degree of confidence can range from uh, zero to one. Right now, the standard neoclassical theory also assumes that people take those actions which, given their beliefs, seem like the most sensible gamble to make. Right? So you can take an action not knowing whether anything will work out, in fact, say if you've ever applied to graduate school or uh, done interviewing, right, you will realize that none of this is guaranteed. Right? Nevertheless, this does not mean that there, is, there aren't some courses of action that are more sensible than others. Right? For example, if you were looking for a job, you could lie around in bed all day, hoping that someone will give you a call. However, that is not likely to be the most sensible way of doing things. Said usually you're better off if you get out of bed, usually but not always. Maybe you missed the one crucial call, which would have been the best job of your life because you were out foolishly interviewing, right? but uh, that would be unusual. Right now, probability theory is the foundation for search theory, right? which is essentially is the basic economic theory of action under uncertainty. And, it's, and it winds up concluding, to make a long story short, that individuals wind up balancing expected marginal benefits against expected marginal costs. Right? So if you go to the simple part of the textbook with perfect knowledge, they'll say people balance balanced marginal benefits against marginal costs. Once you add an uncertainty, we usually wind up saying essentially that people balance expected marginal benefits against expected marginal costs. Okay, so for example, take a deer hunter. Right? If anyone has seen the movie with Robert De Niro, right? so anyway, there is a deer, they, are, they hunt deer in the movie, right? and there's, there's some efforts to go after them, right? and uh, as you might guess, so they do not always successfully get a deer. Right? Sometimes you go out, do the best you can, even though you are a professional deer hunter, nevertheless, you uh, wake up in the morning early, hunt around all day, and you don't find any deer, so you come home empty-handed. So, this, but nevertheless, a deer hunter can still compare the expected benefits against the expected costs of his action. Right? So a deer hunter who gets up early in the morning is more likely to bag a deer, although nevertheless there's no guarantees in life. That's what the world of imperfect knowledge means. Right now, incidentally, there is one Austrian graduate student who remained nameless who confessed to me that as far as he was concerned, search theory was a great guide to dating. So, so, so when he was considering exactly how much effort he should put in to different avenues, and uh, you know, various other methods, how to dress, what to say, right? He found that search theory was an excellent guide to his behavior, right? And he used it religiously. So, anyway, he admitted there was some, some value to the neoclassical approach. All right, so now, now Austrian economists reject the, the, the use of search theory, at least as being an all-encompassing theory. Right now, there are some Austrians that Pete would distance himself from, like Mises Rothbard, who essentially said that probability theory could never be used for anything interesting. That the only way you can use it is in a game of cards or a game of chance. And if you think a little bit more about it, you can't even use it there because how do you know that they're playing with, with a non-loaded deck? Right? There's always, you know, how can you actually say for sure that the deck is not loaded? Right? So you can't, so you can't even use probability theory to decide how to play poker because you don't know whether or not, in fact, you have a normal deck of cards. Okay, so I think that Pete and many other Austrians would say that position is actually too extreme. Right, and they'd say, we well, want to back away from that, but still not give probability theory the whole game. And we're not going to actually give away the whole show to probability theory. Right? And what he's going to say is that there's an important feature of the world that probability theory misses. 
Right now, there is a long list of names for essentially the same thing. So I'll give you four synonyms. You know, the main one I think is used is radical uncertainty. Right, so Plaintiff's probability theory ignores radical uncertainty. Right, and then if you want to go through, what are the other names? Well, there's radical uncertainty, there's sheer uncertainty, there's radical ignorance, there's sheer ignorance. All four words mean exactly the same thing. Right, so they, oh, these are all something or other that probability theory is not able to capture. So you know, what exactly is that special something that it can't capture? Well, what it's supposed to capture is that sometimes people just have no idea at all about what is going on. Probability theory, you always at least have some under, some guess about how things are, right? And what this supposedly ignores is this radical uncertainty where you may just be completely and totally clueless. Right? You may be radically clueless. You may have no idea whatsoever. Right? And also sometimes people describe this in slightly different terms as not knowing that you don't know. Right? Not knowing that you don't know. So with probability theory, you realize that you don't know. Right? With radical ignorance, you don't even realize that. Right? You are not even you are not, aren't even uh, made aware of the fact that you're ignorant. Okay, so this, this may seem like a very odd point to make such a fuss about. But you know, well, what exactly are the implications of radical ignorance are supposed to be? Right? Well, I think, think they are they, at least they've often been thought to be quite expansive by Austrians, and I think people will go along with this. Well, I, mean, I will give you a list or a chain of reasoning about what exactly it is that the that ignoring radical ignorance leads to. Well, you know, people say if you don't, if you ignore radical ignorance, well, then you wind up being unable to, to say that there's ever such a thing as surprise in the world. Right? Without ra radical ignorance, there's no such thing as surprise. Right? And once you wind up saying that, then Pete may say you wind up under, you wind up not really appreciating what entrepreneurs do in the world. Right? So what entrepreneurs do is they notice surprising things. They consider things that other people had never even thought of. Other things that people were radically ignorant of. Right? And when you wind up underrating the entrepreneur, you also wind up underrating the importance of economic calculation. Right? The profit and loss accounting that entrepreneurs do. Right? And once you've done these things, well then you are already on the road to socialism. <laughs> you are on the road to socialism because once you wind up underrating the importance of the entrepreneur, you wind up overrating the ability of government to mimic the market. You wind up overrating the ability of government to mimic the market when you ignore the role of the entrepreneur. Right? And as soon as you, as you wind up ignoring or wind up overstating the ability of government to mimic the market, well, there's two things that are going to happen. One, you are going to be intellectually more open to the socialism. Right? And a second thing that will be added is, in fact, the reason why socialism did not work, why the reason, the reason socialism was such a disaster, was that, in fact, they did not have this use of economic calculation, profit and loss, that was alone given to us by entrepreneurs, right? these great neglected people. Now, this is a whole package, but if you just want to go through it again, right, we begin with radical, right, so, so you know, the neoclassical economists ignore radical ignorance. In ignoring radical ignorance, they wind up understating the importance of the entrepreneur, right, and as a corollary, ignoring the importance of profit and loss accounting, right, and once you, once you understate the importance of the entrepreneur and, and of this profit and loss accounting, you wind up overestimating the ability of government to mimic the market, and once you have overestimated the ability of government to mimic the market, you wind up being overly open to socialism. Right? And moreover, they will add that in many cases that the real reason why socialism was such a failure was precisely that they thought they could mimic the market without prices and they could not. Right now, this is a rather complicated position. Right? There's something like a five-step program. Right? There are five steps going through you know, all of the intellectual errors that you were led to inexorably by lack of appreciation for radical ignorance. Right, what I'm going to do is try to go and un unpack this and just take it apart one piece at a time. Okay, so to start with, right, what in the world is radical ignorance? Right, what in the world is radical ignorance? Right, I'm going to have to be very difficult here. I am just going to sit here and resist the idea that there's anything to this concept until someone convinces me otherwise. All right, and unfortunately, since we've already argued about this for you know, maybe hundreds of hours, it's not likely that it will happen tonight. Right, but anyway, I will, I will urge the same attitude upon you. Right, until you are convinced there is such a thing, don't believe it. Don't be too quick to buy it. You know, I'll say is you may have poetic license to say you have just no idea at all about something. Right, but literally that's never true. It is literally never true that you have no idea at all about something. Okay, like take any technological advance from the last century. You know, any technological advance that all they might want to think of. Right, so, so for example, the case of the introduction of the car. Or you may say before the car came along, people had no idea there could ever be anything like a car. I think this is really over underestimating people at the time. Yes, it's true they couldn't have actually laid out in any detail, you know, there's going to be cars, they're going to do these things, they'll have automatic windows, right? so they wouldn't have been able to tell you that. Nevertheless, there's plenty of things they could have told you, like they could have said, oh, we're moving from animal power to mechanical power. 
you know, wonder if that could have any implications for transportation. Right, and even before that, they still had the idea of, well, let's see, there could be improvements in transportation. Let's see, you know, maybe we could breed a better horse, maybe we could have something that would be like a horse, only without the horse. Right, so this is a horseless carriage. Right, they might think along those terms. Okay, so in other words, few people were sitting around daydreaming about the future. Right, so there, there may have been very few futurists saying, you know, what will the future of travel be like? Nevertheless, what came along is far from being something they had never conceived of in any respect at all. Right? They may not have been, they were certainly not, in fact, completely sure about it. Right? But they have some general, and I'll say if they have some general sense, then it's not true to say they have no idea at all. And in fact, I think that in real life, when someone says they have no idea at all about something, it isn't that they really don't have any idea at all, they just don't want to be embarrassed. Right? If you say, you know, what was the capital of ancient Assyria? Right? Well, they know it wasn't Paris. If they know it wasn't Washington, D.C., there are many guesses they could give you that are better than others. Right? And in fact, uh, say if, if Samuel Jackson held a gun to their head and said, you know, the next thing out of your mouth will be an answer to this question, or else that will be the end for you, right? They would give you an answer, and it would not be it would not be Paris or London, right? They might you know they might say Babylon, they might say you know, any number of other cities, Eridu. I don't even know what the capital of Syria is, but uh, I, you know, certainly there are some guesses I would prefer over others. Okay? So I'd say that in fact, when someone says I just have no idea at all, it isn't literally true. What it is is they don't want to have to take a guess because it's more embarrassing to guess and be wrong in many cases than it is to simply say, oh, I'm not going to answer your question. I think it's a, a fairly common thing. So many times people ask you a question, it's somewhat embarrassing to give any answer, and so you dodge the question, not because you couldn't give a best answer, but because you would just rather not. Okay, now I'll say I am not much of an inventor at all. Right, I've never invented anything, right, I don't follow technology all that closely. Nevertheless, it would be crazy to say that I have no idea at all about the future of technology. Like, here's one thing that I am willing to put money on. It will continue to progress. We are not going to go back in time. Right? Things are not going to become more primitive. They're going to keep getting better, more advanced. Right? The even technology that we have is going to be improved upon. Right now, I could be wrong. Right? There could be a nuclear holocaust tomorrow, and we are driven back to the Stone Age. Right? Possible, but not likely, and I will bet on that. I guess, or at some odds in any case. Hmm. All right. So anyway, it's crazy to say I have no idea at all what the future holds. And I'll say, you know, if I don't know this about technology, what, what, it, what possibly could it be that I have no idea about? You know, you have no idea about how society will develop? Say I'm a lot more confident about how society develop, will develop than how technology will develop. Hmm. Okay, so that's the first thing I'll say is I'm just not convinced that this concept of radical ignorance is even coherent. You know, it's not even that I'm denying its applicability, I just don't think it makes any sense. <coughs> You know, the only thing I can think of has no idea at all about something to say a glass of water. A glass of water has no idea what's going on, because it's not conscious at all. Right? But for any, any being that, have, that is conscious at all, they have some idea. Right? It may be highly imperfect, but nevertheless, it's not true that it is ever radical in the sense that Austrians will say. Right? Now, the next thing I want to move on into is neoclassical surprise. Right? Neoclassical surprise. Right? Pete is just plain wrong to say that probability theory cannot explain surprise. There's, in fact, a very simple probability theory explanation for what surprise is. And then, here it is. The occurrence of, of extreme low probability events is inherently surprising. <laughs> Very simple. You win the lottery. That's surprising. Is it because you didn't know that you could win the lottery? No, of course not. You know you can win the lottery. That's why you buy a ticket in the first place. Is it because it can happen? Right? So you are aware of the, of the possibility. Right? However, when you scratch the ticket and it turns out you won, you're surprised because a very unlikely thing nevertheless occurred. Right? And moreover, it is an extreme event. So you might not be so surprised by winning ten dollars. Well, that's pretty unlikely as well. But uh, nevertheless, if it were the actual, you were actually the winner, right? It is a one in thirty million event, right? And you are completely shocked to win, not because you didn't think it could happen. In fact, you were pretty sure it would happen to someone, right? What is unlikely is that it would happen to you. Or to give another example, uh, let's take the case of a surprise party. See, I was actually at a certain person's surprise party uh, not too long not too long ago. And uh, what, would you, what can you say about it? Well, suppose, just hypothetically speaking, that your wife has a small party for you with just the family and says, this is your 40th birthday party, right? And then, like a week later, says, oh, well, let's go out to dinner at a certain restaurant. What is it? Brian's Grill? Yeah. Uh, let's just go out there to Brian's Grill. And then you go there, and suddenly 50 of your friends jump up and say, surprise. <laughs> right now, uh, what would you say about this? What I'd say, and in fact, I have photographic proof of this, is that Pete was surprised. <laughs> I was actually thinking, I, in fact, I, personally, partly in anticipation of this debate, I was actually standing there with my camera waiting to get exactly the best look on his face. Then he bring the picture around, but I was too worried about losing it right, you know, in, the, in, the, in the audience. So I have a picture of him looking surprised. Now you may ask, 
Was Pete aware that there were such things as surprise parties? <laughs> I think he was. I think he knew that there were such a thing as such him looking surprised. Now you may ask, was Pete aware that there were such things as surprise parties? <laughs> I think he was. I think he knew that there were such a thing such things as surprise parties. And he also knew a number of other things about surprise parties, such as they happen more often around the time of your birthday. <laughs> and surprise parties are more likely to happen in some general proximity of your birthday. All right, and here's the last thing I bet that he knew. They're more likely to happen in birthdays that are evenly divisible by 10. Right, so it was a 40th birthday. A lot more likely that you have a surprise 40th birthday than a surprise 39th birthday or a surprise 41st birthday. So I say this is the new classical theory of surprise. The occurrence of extreme, of extreme unlikely events is inherently surprising and there's no need to go any further. Now the next point that I make against the Betke view of radical ignorance is that search theory is actually highly consistent with a full appreciation for entrepreneurship. I mean, search theory is perfectly consistent with thinking that entrepreneurs do great things in the world, which I believe they do. So I will happily agree with Pete that most economists unfortunately neglect the role of the entrepreneur. Right? They don't give him due credit. Right? He, the entrepreneur is ignored. What I deny is that there's any intellectual reason for this. I deny that there's any actual intellectual reason. There's nothing in neoclassical theory that says entrepreneurs don't matter. Right? All that it is is you have a bunch of people working on topics. Some topics they think are interesting, other ones they don't. And this isn't one of the ones they think is interesting. There's lots of topics they don't think are interesting. I don't think there's any actual doctrinal reason, simply that, you know, if, say, if Samuelson had said 50 years ago entrepreneurship is really important, probably today there would be a lot of people doing it. Right? But he didn't say that. Schumpeter said it, but people thought he was weird. So, but certainly didn't, Schumpeter didn't say anything about radical ignorance. Hmm. All right, now, so what can you think of now? How can you think about entrepreneurs in terms of search theory? Well, I think of entrepreneurs as being very much like deer hunters, right? except instead of hunting animals, they're hunting profits. Right? So there are profit opportunities out there in the world. Some people are very bad at finding them, like me. Right? I don't have any great ability to find profit opportunities, right? any more than I have any ability to successfully hunt a deer. Actually, sometimes deer wander into my backyard, so I think I'm more likely to successfully kill a deer than I am to ever find a profit opportunity, right? or at least a major one, a major one. See, I found, I found an underpriced CD at uh, Tower Records yesterday, if that counts. <laughs> Probably not. So I'm not going to say, now I'm an entrepreneur. Right? No, I'm still not an entrepreneur. Right? So anyway, just as entrepreneurs are hunting for deer, entrepreneur, or just as deer, hunter, or as deer hunters are hunting for deer, entrepreneurs are hunting for profit, and there are some people who have it, and some people don't. Some people are good at it, some people are not. Right? And uh, of course, in both cases, the best person occasionally fails. Occasionally, you have a great entrepreneur who winds up going bankrupt, because right, he made a few big mistakes. Right? Nevertheless, doesn't mean that he didn't have the talent, just like it doesn't mean that he did not have the talent when a deer hunter comes home empty-handed. Okay? So in fact, there is a very simple neoclassical way of thinking about what entrepreneurs do, right? which in fact doesn't require any theoretical innovation, but just the application of a well-known model to a slightly different circumstance. Now, the last thing I'll point out, this is a big topic. Right? Uh, so actually, uh, what I'm planning on doing tomorrow is setting up a web page based upon this debate where I will include links to several other papers of mine. Right? And also, Pete wants me to link to anything, to anything of his, I'll, I'll link to his as well. Right? But in any case, uh, the, the, this is the question of economic calculation. Right? And what I have a whole paper on this. The, the, ba the basic point is that lack of economic calculation was not, in fact, the main reason why socialism didn't work out in practice. It was not, in fact, contrary to many Austrian claims, the main reason for the failure of socialism. Right? Now, this is so involved and requires so much history, I will just give you the very short, baby version of it. Right, long story short, where do socialist revolutions in fact happen? They happen in backwards agricultural countries like Russia and China. Right? And if you go and take a look at that, these countries, the farmers there were generally not even literate. They certainly were not doing any profit and loss accounting. Right? They couldn't even read and write for the most part. So there's no question of them actually going and keeping detailed books and recording whether or not they're making profit. They were not doing economic calculation even before the communists came along. Right, so, in, a, in any formal sense, which is what Austrians will often say is important, right, to actually have some kind of structure. Okay, so, in fact, they were not doing this. So, here's what you can say. Right? You can blame the communists for a great many things. You can't blame them for abolishing something that didn't exist in the first place. Right, so, when the communists showed up, they were not doing economic calculation for the most part. Therefore, you could not say the reason the countries went down the tubes is because the economic calculation was abolished, because economic calculation did not even exist beforehand. Right, so, that is not the reason. Right, if you do want to say, well, what was the problem? Well, it's a very simple one that any neoclassical economist could understand. Farmers don't like growing food for free. 
Farmers do not like growing food, growing food for free. That is all you need to understand why there were mass famines and mass death in the Soviet Union and Communist China and many other communist countries. Right? The farmers were asked to grow food in exchange for basically nothing, or maybe in exchange for not getting shot, and this did not work out very well. Right, I'd also like to add that, interestingly, very often Austrians will say the reason why the Soviet Union lasted as long as it did is because essentially they could free ride off the Western price system. Right? They could actually piggyback their own decision making on the prices that we had here. Right? Now what Austrians do not tell you, however, is that typically, even when the Soviets, for example, could use Western prices to inform the decisions, they generally chose deliberately not to. They generally refused to do so. Right? So, for example, if you read Hedrick Smith's, Hedrick Smith's book, The Russians, he tells the history of the Kama Truck Factory. This was designed to be the world's largest truck factory, and largest truck factory in human history. It was a big Soviet propaganda project. They brought in all the Western media. Right? And what did they do? Well, they essentially ignored all the Western evidence suggesting that the economies of scale for truck factories were at way below the level they were building. Right? So the whole thing was a big failure. And then you say, well, why did they do it? Well, you know, if you actually look into the history, the main thing that was being done wasn't any great effort to actually build trucks. They wanted to bring in a lot of foreign media and go and say, look, we're building the world's greatest truck factory here. Look at what a wonderful achievement we have. We are continuing to build socialism. In other words, the people in charge were being rewarded on the basis of international prestige and ideological prestige, and raising living standards simply wasn't something that got there with the pay. So again, uh, economic calculation is being overrated. Now, I'll say that there is, in fact, one big defect in the neoclassical approach to imperfect information. And then, interestingly, this defect is almost given a, free, a complete free ride by Austrians. They, all, they ignore it almost completely and pay no heed to it. And, and what, what is that problem? Well, the problem is this. Do the probabilities that people assign actually fit the facts? Or it's one thing to say, yes, people use probability theory. It's another thing to say that the probabilities they have make any sense. So to take a classic example, hope everyone here knows about the statistics on flying versus driving. Right, per mile, right, uh, flying is a much safer way of traveling. And yet there's a lot of people who stubbornly resist this idea. A lot of people will stubbornly resist, and, you know, and they'll even make completely illogical arguments like, yes, but when my car stalls, I don't fall 40,000 feet. And you say, you know, I've already adjusted for that. <laughs> I've already adjusted for the fact that conditional upon a plane stalling you die. It's a question of how many miles. And, you know, it's very hard to communicate this to many people. Right? And there is, an, in fact, an entire field of behavioral, of behavioral economics that looks into, the, it looks into the extent to which empirically people's beliefs actually map on to the way that the real world really works. Right? And while uh, people are far from completely crazy, you can certainly uncover many problems. Right? And then if you want to look in a more policy-relevant direction, right, uh, which I have, right, uh, you can take something like basic economics tells us that free trade is highly socially beneficial right, and makes countries richer. Right. Nevertheless, if you try going home at Thanksgiving and selling your entire family on this proposition, right, and in fact telling everyone we're not leaving this table until everyone signs on to the benefits of free trade, right, you're going to have some problem. Right? More likely you'll just alienate your relatives, which you know, may be your goal in the first place. But in any, in any case, right, you're going to find that it's very hard to get non-economists to accept the, the benefits of free trade. Right. Uh, so I've actually done a fair amount of work on this. So I call this these systematically biased beliefs about economics. I think that this, this is a question of great importance for understanding why we have the various foolish policies that exist. It's because people actually don't understand economics. And moreover, they misunderstand in a certain direction. They tend to think that protectionism is going to work out much better than it really does in the real world. All right now, what is Professor Betty going to tell you about this? Well, he's going to make, make an argument of the following sort. He's going to say that you know, just by the fact that I focus on people's erroneous views, that makes me an Austrian. Right? I am an Austrian merely in virtue of the fact that I think this topic of systematically biased beliefs about economics is interesting. Because right? that, that is supposedly Austrian. Right? Now, I actually have a name for this tactic. I call this the Hayek said the sky is blue tactic. <laughs> Hayek said the sky is blue. Right? So, you know, how does this tactic work? Well, you know, I say the sky is blue, and you say, well, you're an Austrian. Because Hayek said the same thing in an article back in the 30s. <laughs> Back, back in the 30s, back in the 30s, there was an important debate about the color of the sky. Hyde maintained it was blue, right? And you are in the tradition of Hyde because you too believe the sky is blue, right? Or to take a more realistic example, right? You know, Hyde talked a bit about mistaken beliefs. I certainly agree that he did, right? And therefore, anyone who comes from a thousand intellectual miles of this topic suddenly stamped uh, as being an Austrian, whether they want to be or not. Right now, to be blunt, I think this is pretty ridiculous. This is ridiculous. 
Right, and he goes, by this standard, not only does Hyatt get credit for a lot of ideas that he did not anticipate, Hyatt gets credit for things that came along before he was born. Right, Hyatt winds up getting credit for almost anything and everything. Anytime anyone anywhere mentioned the subject of knowledge, and suddenly this is getting, the credit is being given to Hayek. So I think this is a rather odd way of doing things. And, you know, as I said, I'll admit Hayek made some contributions, right, although he was very repetitious. Very repetitious. <laughs> right, but he did very little to advance modern rational expectations, the rush for modern rational expectations theorizing, and he certainly did almost nothing to note the empirical weaknesses in this theor theoretical tendency that he didn't anticipate. And now, of course, you may ask, would I have done any better? I know, probably not. But, you know, if I hadn't done any better, I wouldn't want my posthumous uh, intellectual followers running around saying that I deserve credit for it. Or, or anyway, even if I did want it, I would not, I, I would not deserve it, you know, whether or not I would enjoy it. Maybe I would enjoy it. <laughs> right now, stepping back to my title, you know, why is it that you shouldn't be an Austrian economist? Why should you not be an Austrian economist? Well, the fundamental reason is, is that their main original claims are not true. But it isn't that they are always wrong, of course, they're frequently right. And generally, they're frequently right when they say things that a lot of other economists believe as well. Right? But when they stray over into their own original material, this is where they generally wind up being wrong. And in consequence, I think it's also interesting is even when Austrians hit on a good topic, even when Austrians hit on a good topic, they don't, they don't really wind up following through. And the reason they don't wind up following through is because they're so concerned to not be neoclassical. Right? Every time they start to say something about this topic, they have to say, well, is that a neoclassical thing to say? If so, I don't want to say it. I don't want to say anything that could be that could simply be said, well, it's just neoclassical. So there's an effort to bend backwards in order to avoid saying anything that, that another person could agree with, right, who is not in your school. Right, so for example, right, take the, this whole Austrian, uh, Austrian view about the importance of the entrepreneur. I think a perfectly reasonable view. Right, but how do they actually wind up defending this position on the importance of the entrepreneur? Well, in fact, if you take a look at the Austrian literature, what you find out find is that you have scores of articles that philosophize about things like radical ignorance, genuine uncertainty, true knowledge, real surprise, and all sorts of highfalutin adjectives right, attached to seemingly normal words, or we can't possibly go down that route. Right? And then uh, back to saying you know, radical uncertainty, genuine uncertainty, radical ignorance, real surprise, right? using a lot of philosophical buzzwords, right? but I don't think actually getting very far. So anyway, you know, how any of this philosophizing shows that in the real world, entrepreneurs are, are important and are being undervalued is completely beyond me. So don't see how in a room you could sit around and say, well, yes, but the, this theory does not account for genuine uncertainty or genuine ignorance. Say, therefore, entrepreneurs are important. This is no way you're ever going to make that leap. So you know, what, if you really wanted to actually investigate this question and make progress, what would you do? Well, here's what I suggest you would do. Right. First of all, start with the common sense notion of entrepreneurship that you get out of search theory. Start with the common sense notion of entrepreneurship that you get out of search theory. Say, look, there's nothing that, ama you know, nothing that amazing conceptually about an entrepreneur. It's like there's nothing that amazing conceptually about a deer hunter. Right? The only question is, you suspect that entrepreneurs make a much bigger contribution to our economy than deer hunters do. Okay, so you begin with a very simple idea. Well, what exactly is that entrepreneurs do? Entrepreneurs are there searching for profit opportunities. Right? That is their function. That is what they contribute. Right, and once you have this, this idea down, then you can look at the world. And then there are many different possibilities that, su that suggest themselves. Like here's one of some interests uh, in Africa and Uganda under the dictator Idi Amin. Essentially the entire Indian merchant class was expelled from the country. Right, and I think it might be interesting to see, gee, did the economy of Uganda suffer as a result of expelling all their best entrepreneurs? That's one thing that you might investigate. I, I, I don't think, uh, no one's done it. I have a strong suspicion as to how it would come out. Of course, you may say there's so many other things uh, bad going on in Uganda at the time, hard to isolate. Nevertheless, I think it, is, it would be an interesting test case. Other things you might do, you might go and take a look at the economic history of 19th century industrialists. Or you might go and try to, inter you know, to interview some dot-com visionaries. Right, who right now probably have a lot more time on their hands than <laughs> years ago. Essentially, I'd say as long as you are not talking about radical ignorance, there's a chance you are on the right track to establishing the real-world importance of entrepreneurs. Now, I will say at the end that I think that there is a lot of talent in the Austrian school. Right? That is the reason why I spend so much time arguing with them. I don't spend a lot of time arguing with Marxist economists because I don't think there's a lot of talent in their school. Right? And I'm just waiting for it to die. <laughs> On the other hand, in the case of Austrian economists, I think that, in fact, there is a lot of talent. Right? And I'll say, you know, where else can you find so many economists right, who appreciate the virtues of free markets, 
who write in plain English and who are boring. It's not easy to find many other economists who wind up satisfying those three criteria. Okay, so my motive then in criticizing Austrians is to try to persuade them to reallocate their talent. Right, to take the talent that I believe they do in fact have and move it over in another direction. I right, move it over in another direction. Right, so, you know, stop talking about subjectivism and process all the time. Right, so stop talking about subjectivism and process all the time. You know, quit being amateur philosophers, waxing poetic about radical uncertainty. It is unseemly. <laughs> right now, I do know that Austrians have a lot of interesting ideas about the untapped power of free markets and about the way that government intervention messes things up. So I think they have a lot of interesting ideas along these lines. So really, the only thing that needs to be done is for them to put them down on paper, right, argue for them using arguments that are, in fact, relevant, right, you know, convince people that you're right, and I'd say that you know, even if you make a credible, a credible effort at saying that you're right, there are a lot of open-minded economists who will be interested to read what you have to say. I'll say probably I will be among them. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> No, seriously, I agree. Why do I agree? Because your position's reasonable. But it's not neoclassical. It's a pipe dream to think that this is neoclassical economics as defined or practiced at, at you know, the major universities. Your professors at Princeton didn't have these views. That's, they don't do that. That's not the kind of work that they do. They don't write the papers that you write. Uh, so your position is reasonable, but it's not neoclassical. I don't know if it's Austrian or not. I'm a subjectivist enough to say that if you want to say you're not an Austrian, then you're not an Austrian. Uh, <laughs> no, I'll try to say, you know, why it is that I think that, that it's, it's relevant. See, I think that the biggest distinction here is an empirical one. It's not a theoretical one. I want to make a... a, a uh, conceptual distinction between problems that we have where it's the case that our cognitive imperfections are such that we know that we don't know something, which is basically, uh, you know, rational expectations theory, or, you know, the, the idea of, of rational ignorance. The idea that we, what we think we know ain't so, which is what Brian Kaplan's talking about, where people hold uh, stupid beliefs and they hold on to them doggedly and uh, <coughs> that we don't know that we don't know and it's an empirical matter of what matters in the world you know all I want to say is give some space to the idea that there are situations in which people are confronted with pure serendipity they're off doing one thing and all of a sudden something else crops up that they didn't even think about before that I'm not saying that it's necessarily the most important thing in the issue. I agree, I should say, I agree with 99% of what Brian said. I disagree adamantly with what he had to say about socialism. Not because I disagree that incentives are what caused the real world socialism to collapse. Uh, that's, that's not the point. This is a very subtle debate, I think, if we want to talk about it later, we can go in those lines of uh, argument. But I actually think it's, it's, a, it's a very subtle issue, the nature of history of socialism and practice and, where, and what role the calculation argument comes to bear on that. What I will say is that Brian, I think, introduces some weasel words here. One of them was neoclassical economics correctly understood. That means neoclassical economics is understood by Brian. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and in that sense, I'm a neoclassical economist. Uh, and he also said any neoclassical economist could argue this. I think it's, it, Brian should go in Bill and Ted's excellent adventure and go back in time and realize that from 1937 to 1985, the majority of economists believed that socialism could work. Theoretically, there was no argument. So you have to remember what it was like, I, 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 some of the students went with me up to Maryland uh, recently. I, I work at uh, this center up at Maryland called IRIS, the Institute for Research on the Informal Sector. And I brought a bunch of them with me. And it was the first paper in my professional career that was given where a guy actually argued socialism was better 
than capitalism. It was like a shock for me because that's what it was when I was an undergraduate. Uh, Brian's too young uh, to remember that. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, back when I was an undergraduate, the, it wasn't only the moral uh, side of arguments uh, were on the side of socialism, but it also tended to be that, you know, they could actually outproduce us. And if you go back even further in time, you've got to remember that when Nikita Khrushchev banged his shoe on the table, it wasn't militarily bury you. It was economically, we will bury you, okay? So yeah, it, it's the world changed a lot. It moved in a different direction. So of course, nowadays, and I benefited from that as an economist who thinks socialism is not, you know, is, is pretty shabby. Uh, you know, I, I benefited from that because during my whole professional career, whenever I've argued about socialism, those who are advocates of socialism were on defensive. You know, so I, I remember when I, you know, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on the history of socialism, and I remember presenting it when I was going out in the job market. And I guarantee you, in some of those rooms, I was talking at, there were faculty members who were true believers, but they couldn't say it at that time, because to say it at that time would be like, you know, uh, you know, I'm really stupid here, recognize <laughs> me. And so they, they, in fact, wouldn't want to say that at that time. All right, let me... Uh, get back on point here. I'm not going to be as charming as Brian. Uh, this is one of the problems of having to comment on Brian, but one of the things I should point out, which reiterates a theme that he had, I've known about Brian and respected Brian's work for a long time, farther back in history than he knew me, because when I was a graduate student, Brian uh, was finished up graduate school, Brian had written this little essay which circulated around through a guy named Sheldon Richmond. Uh, that was his critique of uh, David Friedman. And Tyler, Tyler, Tyler's critique of it, yeah. And uh, it circulated around all of us, so we all had a kind of a, Brian was uh, sort of the great hope of the future, and then he just sort of disappointed all of us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, we're uh, all very excited about Brian. Uh, in fact, I, I can remember an, an internet episode when email groups were first getting started. We had a little email group, and Brian Kaplan joined our email group, and I was all excited until I started reading his posts, uh, and, uh, but that was, uh, that was, that's a whole other uh, idea. As Brian pointed out, we have a deep affinity of our interests, not only the three that he mentions, but actually we two, the two of us have a fascination with uh, the history and practice of real world socialism and fascism, which is unusual among economists. Brian, in fact, has a, uh, uh, his webpage, has a museum of communism, and as far as I know, you haven't written any uh, professional papers, maybe one review on socialism, but the knowledge that he has in the area is, is uh, phenomenal. And in fact, I, I, I reference in my classes for all the students to read it, including over in Eastern Europe this summer when I had a bunch of uh, lefty lunatic uh, students who, uh, you know, uh, uh, didn't grow up under socialism anymore, uh, but grew up under whatever the hell we want to call it now, crony uh, capitalism or whatever. And uh, so they were all like gung-ho for socialism, let's try it. And uh, one kid, in fact, tried to tell me that uh, capitalism kills millions, socialism is the way of the future. Uh, so I pointed him to Brian's uh, webpage. It didn't have the same effect, by the way, that an experiment had, though. We ran the experiments in class. We did a public goods experiment where you're supposed to cooperate to get the public good, and everyone cheats. You know, and the kid screamed out in the middle of the thing that he lost his faith in humanity. Uh, but it wasn't from Brian's website, it was from the experiment. Uh, so I actually uh, fully endorse the experiments now. Um, the, uh, one of the things you have to recognize about Brian is that Brian is probably among the most thoroughly read critics of Austrian economics in the history of the Austrian school. Most people who are critics of the Austrian school they can legitimately criticize it. No one says that they can't, but they, don't, they usually do it from a position of ignorance, not knowing what they had to say. But Brian is thoroughly read in it, and actually George Mason probably has a unique club of these types of people. Uh, uh, Tyler Cowan is another one. Uh, Brian, and, and maybe you might throw Alex in there as well. Um, and uh, that's one of the reasons why it's a very interesting place to be as someone who is uh, interested in these ideas. The problem that I've had historically with Brian's arguments about against Austrianism has little to do, in some sense, with what he argued today. My fundamental criticism 
uh, comes from the idea that Brian follows a kind of a logical argument which says the following thing. Austrian economics equals Mises. Rothbard equals Mises. If I can show that Rothbard is wrong, therefore Mises must be wrong, therefore Austrian economics must be wrong. I deny several links in that argument. One of the reasons is Austrian economics is a genealogy which is much broader than that. And that's one of the things I'm always trying to say. Brian says it's a sky is blue kind of thing. That might be true, but one of the ways in which you judge a school of thought is what kind of directions of research it spawns, right? And in fact, a school of thought, to be successful, should destroy itself, right? Let's not, you know, get caught up in any of these silly ideas that we're going to have five guys in a room be totally pure, and that's going to be an effective way to do things. If we actually won the day, you know, we'd be teaching at Harvard. You know, hi, Andre, how you doing? I'm hanging out with you today. Right? We would take over the economics profession, be the editor of the American Economic Review. And so one of the things that you have to look at in the history of a school of thought is actually the kind of ideas in which it's motivated, uh, uh, generated and the kind of work that it's gone because it's gone in different directions. And in this regard, you can slice the view of Austrian economics through like Morgan Stern. You can do all these things like that. So the Austrian school is extremely vibrant in a way that I, that I would uh, suggest many other schools haven't been in terms of the directions in which it's pushed people in. All right? So I think that's one of the things that I think Brian reads the narrow version. It's sort of like reads Murray Rothbard's, like you know, uh, the 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 you know the back cover of Rothbard's book, you know, and, or Hans Hoppe's book, and says, all right, that's good. Now, one of the problems with Brian, which makes him very unique, which is one of the reasons for the disappointment earlier, uh, <laughs> is that um, when I was growing up in Austrian economics, everyone knew that these guys like Ludwig Lachmann and Israel Kirzner were more sophisticated and more uh, like academically successful than, than say, you know, my teacher as an undergrad, Hans Senholtz or, you know, Murray Rothbard or whatnot. Precisely because Senholtz and Rothbard eschewed the profession completely. But Brian actually argues that the radical subjectivists and the entrepreneurial perspective is incoherent it's kind of an interesting twist because the very people who everyone thought were like the ones that are the most sort of successful, he argues, are the most incoherent. And the ones who everyone thinks are the least successful and the most dogmatic are the most coherent but wrong. See, so he flips the debate. It's like going, you know, it's actually, to someone like me, it's very interesting because it's like my brain gets blown up. Brian provides a, a brain quake like this, right, to my head because it's like, how can you possibly think that? But, you know, he does. Um, and, and so the question is, 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 is why is that the case? And I think that he put his finger on it at the end of his talk, which I completely agree with, is that the problem with a lot of those people, these subjectivists and, and entrepreneurial perspectives, is they, is they made their argument at such an abstract level and in reference to an abstract model the abstract model being Arrow, Hahn, De Bru model, and they made it in reference to that, that what ended up by happening was they're so, they're not any touch to reality. So I agree completely with Brian that if Austrians want to prove them to be more robust than other sort of approaches to economics, they should in fact be radically empirical and show the, the uh, demonstration of their effects in economic history and things like that. And I think one of the biggest problems with the Rothbard branch of Austrian economics is it convinces young people that they don't have to do history. Even though Rothbard did more history than anyone else, they talk about this idea as if, like, I can spin out all of economic theory without ever looking at the world. As I said, I'm not, as, as, uh, I'm not being as charming as Brian, so you have to bear with me in being boring. So I'm being boring tonight. And the reason is... I think there's a space in economic science that's vital for the defense of a free society. See, there's a connection here. What Brian, I don't believe that natural rights, I'm going to be ideological for a second, I don't believe natural rights can carry the load of a defense of a free society. The defense of a free society has to come from economic science. Okay? Now, that's a normative purpose of a positive science. 
All right, so I admit that it, you have to have some, some various different normative, uh, you know, subsidiary assumptions in there to get from that. But you have to have economic science has to do it. And if you don't allow for certain uh, space about the role of institutions and, and in particular liberty, you're not going to end up by getting that defense. And here's the, the way that space, I think that it's a, you can divide the world up into a problem situation and outcomes in the world. Simple, complex, okay? In a simple world, right, so it's to say think of when you're in economics class, perfect competition model, the outcomes of that that fall, this is where the domain of standard neoclassical theory lies. Over here, the critics of economics in general, people like, you know, Marxists, institutionalists, they argue we're pretty screwed up even in the most simple of worlds. Right? Things don't really work out so well even in the simplest of worlds. Standard neoclassical market failure theory argue introduce some subsidiary assumptions which move us away from a, com uh, from a simple uh, in, uh, problem situation and we end up with market failure. And it's my contention that there's a group of economists Austrians, of, of, of whom are probably among those who are prominent, but what would now be called new institutional economics in general, which in fact finds space here, which is that, you know, you can in fact find uh, very uh, uh, efficient outcomes within very complicated problem situations. Problem situations which challenge our cognitive capabilities to cope with it. Why? How do we do it? The argument comes back to institutions. It's an issue of institutional intelligence. Let me give an example of the, to show the relationship with neoclassical economics. The marginalist principles come out of a process. They're not an assumption going in. The institutions weed behaviors out. People are pretty stupid. Or they're not that, they're lazy. They're not homo economicus. But what prods them to act in a certain way is the institutional environment within which they behave. If you have an institutional environment in which their bad beliefs are not penalized, they're going to hold on to those bad beliefs. Oops, I just made an argument Brian Kaplan makes. It's an argument that comes out of Austrian economics. It's not the sky is blue. It's an argument which comes out of our focus not on the behavioral assumptions of perfection, but instead on the institutions that allow us to cope with our cognitive imperfections. Okay, that's where Austrian economics lies. That's why the socialist calculation debate was interesting. It's not that the people in Russia are stupid. It's not that they don't try to equate marginal benefits with marginal costs. It's that within the institutional environment in which they're behaving, their equating of those, of, of those marginal costs and marginal benefits, they don't have enough signals to push them in a certain other direction, which would be consistent with quote unquote economic efficiency in terms of, of uh, the technological possibilities and the economic feasibilities. There's an interconnection between the knowledge problems and the, in, in, in the incentive problems. So why would I argue that Kaplan's an Austrian? First of all, what is Austrian economics? Austrian economics is an actor, actor orientation in which beliefs uh, uh, generates actions and cognitive, cognitive imperfections. And we recognize that the ongoing process of economic life is continuously unfolding. Economics is fundamentally about exchange and the institutions within which exchange takes place. That's it. Austrian economics has no unique claim to this, it's just called catalactics. It goes all the way back to classical economics. Mises never said that the only people who ever thought good thoughts were those born in Vienna. He, go, he draws a line throughout the history of economics about all kinds of people who talk about exchange behavior. And that's what the, the main focus of Austrian economics is on. 
exchange behavior and the institutions within which those exchanges take place. So despite my uh, argument that I'm, I'm not going to try to push Brian because if he's as a subjectivist, if Brian says he's not an Austrian, he's not an Austrian, that's fine. By the way, Ludwig Lachmann was asked that one time about Hutt. You know, because Hutt described himself as an Austrian. So he did the, Hutt was like Brian. But he, but in that days he thought it was cool to call himself an Austrian because there was kind of this revival going on. But Hutt, most of his career, he was just a good economist. And he didn't really care about being an Austrian or not. But, you know, there's this revival going on. So Hutt started saying, well, I'm an Austrian. And so, but he kind of was, uh, had some views that were kind of objectivistic views or something. So well, some Austrians were, you know, concerned about his views. And they asked Lachman, who was the ultimate subjectivist. And they said, well, what do you think? Do you think Hutt, you know, is an Austrian? And Lachman said, you know, you know, the subjectivist. If Professor Hutt says he's an Austrian, he's an Austrian. And, uh, and so I'm saying the, the opposite. Brian says he's not an Austrian, he's not an Austrian. But why would I argue that Brian's an Austrian? First of all, I think, again, this is another thing. Questions. Questions are what drive research. And where do people come up with these questions? They come up with these questions because they read other people who ask questions. And then eventually, sometime down the road, you ask questions. So why is it that Brian Kaplan, of all people, would be one who would ask questions about rational stupidity? Just because... Well, by the way, that would be a surprise. Uh, right? A genuine, maybe, uh, even. Right, it did surprise you because, in fact, it's a question which unfolds out of a long history of trying to deal with questions. So it's the kind of questions that are asked to you in certain things. Or is it a question that's it's a question that comes out of trying to understand the way people interact within different institutional environments? So why is it? Brian, all of Brian's models are actor-oriented. All of his models focus on a manifestation of rational choice within alternative institutional environments. And they recognize the essential role of private property in providing incentives and information to agents so that they can, can engage in successful action. Outside of a setting of, rash, of, of private property, I doubt whether or not Brian would say that individuals could uh, coordinate their activities with others to achieve uh, advanced material production. They could, in fact, maybe coordinate uh, around some like common goal of being like really poor, uh, you know, like I want to be a hermit or something like that, but they're not necessarily going to become an advanced economy that, that uh, lifts the majority of its population out of poverty. All right, so all of Brian's sort of a focus in his, his Austrianism uh, or his questions have an Austrian twang to them if not necessarily an Austrian seal of approval, which I'm against. So to the extent Brian's not an Austrian economist, I would might contend that I'm not an Austrian economist. But it happens I'm the editor of the Review of Austrian Economics. So what does that mean? It means I pretty much define what Austrian economics is. So I define it, sky's blue. <laughs> <laughs> So why does this matter? The reason why it matters, I think, is I think there is a scientific concern. We just want to get at the truth. I mean, Brian's right. I, I, by the way, I only missed one question on his libertarian purity test. Can I say this in this audience? Yeah. Uh, I missed one question. It turns out I'm weak on uh, political assassination of uh, <laughs> I thought that might be a little bit over the top. Uh, but everything else I scored on, you know, like I, you know, I got all the right answers on that one. So I, uh, I, I'm a, uh, um, uh, Brian and I share uh, tremendous amounts of, of, uh, of uh, uh, ideological interests with one another. And we all, and, and, but we, my own view is that, that there's a certain scientific concern which has to do with getting at the truth about the nature of why markets are superior to governmental uh, organizations. And I think that that lies precisely in this role that institutions have in shaping the way that individuals behave. Okay, that, that uh, are, we, we are lazy humans. We're neither, we're neither the devil nor an angel. We just are. We're not perfect calculators of pleasure or pain, and we're not persistently stupid, 
you know, like, oh, I need to get out that door, I keep walking into the glass, okay? That's sort of a reasonable position too, you know, would you call that neoclassical? To say that I wouldn't, I would find, I would, you know, eventually find the door, all right? I mean, you would say that that is, I, you know, okay, fine, we're not persistently stupid, unless that we pay no cost, uh, you know, to doing it. Um, I don't think that that's a, 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 the essence of the problem. The essence of the problem is, how do these institutions arise so that individuals can cooperate with one another and realize the benefits of exchange? I don't care if you call that Austrian, that's the question that I think we want to ask, and it just so happens that writers like Mises and Hayek ask that question too. The second point is, to go back to what I was saying before, unless you get that answer right, in my opinion, you have no defense of a free society. Ayn Rand's not going to cut it. Right? That's like battling over vanilla and chocolate ice cream. Okay? Murray Rothbard does no better. It's vanilla and chocolate ice cream again. But when you can actually bring and marshal to bear the economic consequences of choices, and show people, demonstratively so, that when you pursue certain institutions, you end up with freedom and prosperity, and you pursue other institutions, and you end up with tyranny and poverty, then now you have an argument for why it is that some societies are not only richer, but more desirable. And so it seems to me that ultimately, our ideological affinity has to be based in our economics. And, th and that lion's share of that uh, load has to be carried by our economics and it seems to me we're only going to get there if we in fact approach a world in which the uh, cognitive imperfections of man focuses on the role that institutions play in allowing us to accomplish things that even our own intelligence wouldn't allow us to accomplish. And I'll stop there and I apologize for at this late hour being boring. but. Uh, Well, there's certainly an element of truth in your claim that, in my mind, neoclassical economics rightly understood is whatever I think. So, I mean, there's, there's something to that. However, I, I would hold it to up, to up to a higher standard. I mean, it's true that if you go over to Princeton, they don't talk a lot about search theory and how you can use that to understand entrepreneurship. But I will certainly bet that if you at that you ask, you know, any any economist with any real world interest, you know, could search the would search theory be the right thing about entrepreneurship? All the people at Princeton I know would say yes. And I, I haven't I've have talked to very few of them about this. This is my bet. And so I can give, give you a list of email addresses and we can do a blind we do a blind survey, but I'm very confident this isn't just my idiosyncrasy. It's true I haven't heard them say it, but I think that this they would say, well obviously. You know, and, I, and, I, and in terms of you know neoclassical economics rightly understood, I really do think this is very much along the lines of a world where people have used supply and demand to understand products for goods but not services and saying, look, neoclassical economics rightly understood can also, under can also explain the market for services. It can. Right? So even though actually in the classical economists occasionally they say it's only limited to goods, it's just a mistake of not, not, not seeing the full breadth of the, of the model. So that would be my, I mean, sort of my, gen my general point there is I think actually... Can what, I, can I ask you one yeah. other question? Sure. Um, Austrian economics is neoclassical economics, it's just a variant of it. I mean, from its founding. So how would you respond to that? It's just a variant of neoclassical economics. It's just neoclassical economics that, let's put it your way, is uh, doesn't suffer mathematical abuse, isn't boring, and has libertarian <laughs> conclusions. <laughs> so we can define not being boring into the, into the subject itself. Yeah, well, you're not boring because you're not dealing with simple problem situations in order for mathematical tractability. Yeah. Well, Hayek's kind of boring. Uh, okay, 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 so fine. So you rule Hayek out. But, uh, but how do you deal with the. I mean, what do you mean by neoclassical economics? I think of neoclassical economics as the following that you believe that uh, individuals engage in rational choice. Those rational choices are, are uh, uh, judged against marginalist principles, and that you get a social. Uh, uh, the interactions of agents under certain situations generate an equilibrium. Austrian, I mean, I, I, what I'd like to know from that is, is you know, when, when if, if I came back to you and said Austrian uh, neoclassical economics rightly understood would include Austrian economics, um, what argument would you give? Would you just say that like the sheer ignorance stuff right. is confusing, or is it makes uh, no sense? 
It's incoherent. Yes. I mean, I, I literally, in that's the case, I just don't know what you, what you could be talking about. Just sort of go through all the possibilities. None of them make sense to me. Okay. I'll shut up in your okay. time. All right, now, let's see. Uh, since you use the blackboard, let's see. Can I have the pen? <laughs> see, this, <laughs> this, argument, uh, this, this argument is really uh, orthogonal to radical ignorance, although it's so often bundled with it that I can't resist. Right, and this is the claim of serendipity, saying that search theory can't explain serendipity. Serendipity is a very simple explanation for how to think of serendipity. Right, if we just put your search effort on the x-axis and your expected search results on the y-axis, you know, serendipity is just being a case where, you, with zero effort, you get some result on average. It's a very simple way of thinking about serendipity, saying you don't even have to try at all. Sometimes things just fall into your lap. Right? So that is, that in fact, it is in no way inconsistent with search theory. It doesn't require any significant change. It's just a slight change in the production function. Right? So and, and it is what I say is, I'm perfectly happy to accept the existence of serendipity, but it should just be detached from the entire philosophical package, which is dragging it down. And, you know, on the other hand, I'm not convinced that empirically that's such a big deal, but maybe there's a problem there. Let's see, uh, you, know, you are correct in that my argument in the strategy has sometimes been that, that, you know, that essentially that uh, Rothbard is uh, more or less equivalent to Mises, and Mises is equivalent to Austrian economics, and that's wrong. Right, actually, though, in this talk, oh, right, I, 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 single, I singled you out to begin with, so in fact, I think of this talk as being the critique of you and also Kersner. And I mean, I, I would take that as being wrong, on, wrong for its very own reasons, right? wrong <laughs> for some very different reasons. I, mean, I think your, your description of, of my view about Kersner is basically correct. I mean, what I'd say is there is a sense in which Kersner is more sophisticated. He's more poli polite. He's more genteel. Right? So when you read him, you don't have the sense that you're reading someone who is young and angry. So in, the, in that sense, he's more sophisticated. In terms, however, of, of actually making more sense, no. No, and, and, and they're, they're, these are often imperfectly correlated. Right? Very often, a person who's more polite personally actually is more illogical. Right? On the other hand, a person who's a firebrand may actually be more, be more sensible if you can actually get them to calm down enough to say what they think. Okay, so that is, that is my view. And then I guess, uh, you know, finally, uh, since you, you almost signed on to my Sky is Blue critique, so I'm a little bit puzzled as to how to respond, I guess I'll just say yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can open up to questions, Matt. Yeah, I guess just start ready, raising hands. Uh, do you want to call yeah. you, you You can get yeah, Well, you, you can either specify one or both of us to respond. To. Uh, Brian, with what you were saying about the calculation debate, and saying that the Austrian argument is that when you abolish a calculation in an existing society, that's what the cause is. And that's not really the argument at all. It's that you know, if you want to have industrialization and an advanced division of labor and emerge out of some primitive agricultural arrangements, you're going to need calculation. So, I mean, what you said in terms of the fact that this happened in agricultural in agricultural uh, societies in in uh, relatively backwards countries like Russia back in the teens and China a little bit later. That doesn't really you know, say anything against the calculation argument. In fact, there's still the correlation that when Stalin tries to industrialize, when the Soviets and the Chinese try to go and develop big industries and have division of labor and intensive capital use and get into all of this uh, you know, industrialism mirroring capitalism in the West under property rights arrangements, that then they fail. They're not able to figure out that you know, these huge enterprises are too huge, and uh, so there's still a correlation there. I mean, the correlation doesn't mean just because, you know, the, uh, these enterprises, when they tried to get into them, failed. It doesn't necessarily imply that it's the, calcu the calculation is the reason, but you're pointing out that this came about in a relatively primitive, backwards uh, agricultural society isn't really relevant because Austrians have always said that, fine, you don't need the calculation there, it's when you move beyond it that it becomes necessary. Yeah. I, I disagree. I think actually if you read, read Mises in the original treatment of the calculation debate, he literally says socialism was going to collapse into total chaos you know, as, you know, as soon as they actually appear socialism. He doesn't specify that you can maintain, a, you can maintain an agricultural economy. Pete has been promoting this alternative, more reasonable interpretation that you're suggesting. Although, I, I mean, I, I, and I, in fact, I, uh, on the webpage, I'm going to have my whole paper criticizing Pete's view on this. Right, but I mean, I think you know, even Pete actually alternates between two views. Right, Pete alternates on the one hand between saying, "Well, really, the calculation argument only says that you can, that you will not do as well as you otherwise would." 
but on the other hand says that it you know, shows somehow that socialism is incoherent with respect to the ends of advanced material production and, and uh, progress. So I mean, I would say, I mean, you know, essentially, I would say, a, I think Austrians generally have actually said that calculation is, is in fact not merely going to prevent industrialization, but will actually lead to chaos and starvation. Right, a much stronger argument. And while Pete has tried to make the argument more reasonable, I don't think that he's actually consistently made it more reasonable because he hasn't been able to make up his mind about which which argument he wants most to make. Alex. Let me tell a little uh, story and then uh, have you both uh, comment on this. Uh, from the 1930s to the 1960s, a whole bunch of Austrian economists made all these great critiques of uh, macroeconomics based upon methodological individualism. You know, they said that, uh, look, this is complete nonsense that C is equal, that Y is equal to C plus I plus X minus M, and then you manipulate this and you get macroeconomics. And uh, Hazlitt and uh, Mises and other people completely, you know, had fantastic critiques of this uh, Keynesian aggregate macroeconomics. And then uh, uh, a uh, Austrian economist came along, a, a really brilliant Austrian economist. And this Austrian economist, he'd uh, read Hayek, and in fact he cited Hayek in his work, and he created a, um, a, a model, a macroeconomic model, based upon methodological individualism. And he started making all these critiques of government policy, pointing out that government policy doesn't take into account the knowledge of actors in the economy. And uh, just fantastic Austrian uh, stuff. And uh, of course, I'm talking about uh, Robert Lucas. And Austrians immediately attacked all of that and said, this is not Austrian economics. Uh, this is crazy. This is something else. And uh, they denounced this uh, altogether. Um, so, what, so that's my story. And I'll just get comments from both of you on your interpretation or my. Yeah. My own view? Yeah. This is the biggest mistake Austrians ever made. Uh, Robert Lucas, uh, now there are differences, you know, in their views and stuff, um, but, uh, you know, what, when Kevin Hoover published his book, which is a is, is very, you know, reasonable book, uh, it did have the effect of, of on top of, uh, you know, other Austrians like O'Driscoll and everyone attacking uh, Lucas, of convincing Lucas that, uh, you know, yeah, I'm not an Austrian. So what happened in the 1970s, uh, uh, early 80s, Lucas, especially his essay, The Islands Model, is, is built, you know, foundational on it. I do think that there's technical issues in economics, like neutrality of money and things like that, that you could have argued with Lucas about. But the idea that people didn't jump on the bandwagon of Lucas and ride with it was a huge tactical error. I agree with you. And as a result, you know, uh, we're still hanging out in a broom closet. I mean, you know, it's, I mean, look, I mean, for those of you who, who are young and interested, Austrian economics is very inspirational. There's some real hero stories in it, you know, this kind of things like that. But the reality is, is that, you know, it is sort of like, uh, one of my favorite TV shows is Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And in one of the episodes, Buffy finds out that she is in control of the Watchers. Without her, the Watchers have no job, so she switches the balance of power. And she says to them, without me, all you have is your stories which you'll publish and everyone thinks I'm insane Oh, home journal. <laughs> all right? And this is a problem with a lot of Austrians. I mean, this is because they publish and everyone thinks I'm insane Oh, home journal. And that's it. And they run around and they do all that stuff. And it's a huge mistake to do that. As a young scholar, Try to understand that the world is too interesting to isolate yourself from other economists. I'm not kowtowing to Brian. I'm giving advice to young people to actually try to be relevant in the world. And the way you be relevant in the world is you explain the world out the window. Bob Lucas explained the world out the window better than the alternatives at the time. For people to not find it interesting and work with it was a huge mistake. Yeah, if, you know, if I could respond to Alex's question. And I think the main reason why Austrians had to reject Lucas is because he uses probability theory. Right? So he took their ideas, put them into a simple framework that other economists could understand, and then successfully communicated. Right? And that, and that, and that is, is the great sin, is that he used probability theory in order to explain the world, 
And I think that really, I think it really is that that is where he crossed the line, and that is what made them so unhappy. Is instead of simply talking about imperfect knowledge, he actually put you know put some you know some formal structure on it, and that creates a great deal of unhappiness. No, but the problem, you know, and I think it, it is sort of the, you know, these philosophical scruples which are being violated. And, and you know, on the one hand, you can take the pragmatist view of don't have philosophical scruples. I would take the realist view of have correct philosophical scruples. The scruples against probability make no sense. Right, so don't have them. I, I uh, actually think. Only, I, 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 let me see. I want to just one other thing about. I mean, I thought you were actually going to the question. Can I, I can I just say you make a point and then go back to this? <laughs> the, the, uh, uh, I, I actually think that there's there's a, in the hi a history of these ideas. You have to recognize that the majority of Austrians in the, at that time that were reasonable enough to co uh, deal with Lucas were trained at UCLA by Axel Leyenhofer. And they were trained in the Leyenhofer Clower model. And that Leyenhofer Clower model was an alternative to the Lucas model. So that's the horse they bet on. I mean, look at the way, see, they, they didn't do it for philosophical scruples. They did it because they were betting on the monetary disequilibrium model, which Lucas not only destroyed Keynesianism, he destroyed that model as well. All right, uh, and and uh, and so they all bet on that. Now, of course, there's other arguments or whatever that people made, but I think you could have say they all would have been at Chicago. Then they would have been debating things like, what do you mean by neutral money? How can we get to neutral money? It would have been like the Hayek, you know, debates on what nature of neutral money is or something. So I think a lot of it is a sociological thing, but it's. The Austrians have historically had a tremendous capacity to bet on the wrong horse. You know, let me bet on this horse right when it's like dying. You know, and uh, and rather than betting on the on the on the right horse, and that's just the case in point. Game Sounds theory is another not one. Using probability theory, well enough. what? We're just not using probability. <laughs> right, they're making bad bets. Yeah, <laughs> uh, they are making bad bets. Yeah, sure. I mean, Pete, wouldn't you still say that philosophical scruples are a big part of it? Like Rizzo and Driscoll in, in their book, uh, you know, you know, essentially, but they only have a very brief period where they even mention the use of probability theory to analyze uncertainty, and they basically say that's the same as certainty. You know, that gets them very upset. They say, you know, to just say we know probability distribution rather than the real world is virtually equivalent to saying we know everything, which is a rather odd. No, I, mean, I think that, that, look, there was a lot of mistakes made, and but here's the problem. Exactly. A lot. Yeah, I think so. Because here's the problem: is is, is that what I there's a there's a uh, a German sociologist named Hans Albert, who is was one of the forerunners of new institutional economics back in the 60s, and one of the things that he argued all the time was neoclassical economics will never be able to repair its institutional deficiency until it repairs its behavioral deficiency. And it's only in the last few years that economists have started to do that. When you think about the difference in the way that economists dealt with institutions in economics, and there's been a radical change. I mean, you know, there's this at this university, right? Public choice is in fact an outcome of the fact that other economists couldn't deal with institutions, and the public choice economists stepped inside of the black box. Vernon Smith is a consequence of this showing that it's the institutions that drive the efficiency results, right? The framing of the experiment, not the behavioral uh, capabilities of the agents within. In fact, what he demonstrates is that the less you know about economics, if given the right incentive mechanism, the more, the better outcome you get. The only people who screw up are people like Brian, who will try to outguess the game, <laughs> right? If we study too much economics, we cheat every time in the prisoner's dilemma. Eh. And then we lose, right? We come in last place. So in fact, what's driving the results there are different. And that only has become part of the, the economics paradigm over the last 20 years or whatever. So the, the big thing is, one of my, in my, all my classes on Austrian economics, I have the students read Samuelson's Principles book. It was an experiment a couple years ago. Samuelson's Principles book and Paul Milgram and Robert's book on economic organization and management is sort of embodiments of what's currently cool in economics. Then Murray Rothbard and you know Israel Kirzner are the economics of time and ignorance. Now the thing that's interesting is there's a there's a gulf the size of a sea between Samuelson and Rothbard. But by the time you get to Milgram and Roberts, economics has moved tremendously in the direction that Rothbard put it on, you know, wanted to get it on. So economics has moved tremendously in the direction of the of the areas and so I think that that you know one of the ways that I would in a more boring sort of moment discuss with Brian like in a journal is simply the idea that the term neoclassical economics is contested 
it doesn't mean the same thing. Francis Bator's notion of neoclassical economics or Paul Samuelson's notion is a lot different than Paul Milgram and, 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 and Roberts, Milgram and Roberts' notion, or Abner Greif, or you know, any of the other people, Timur Koran, or any of the other people who are currently you know, practicing relatively mainstream economics, or Ben Bernanke for that matter, your teacher, right? I mean, he's a lot different than the macroeconomists that existed 25 years ago. So when Rothbard and all those guys used to make those arguments 25 years ago, they were right against those people, and now we have to recognize that other people have moved significantly in what? Rothbard's direction. Yay for Rothbard. Not Kersner's direction. Well, to some extent in Kersner's direction. I mean, when you look at all the stuff on creativity, look at the paper by Ostroy in the, the, the sorry to that, but look at a paper in the Journal of Economic Literature by Joseph Ostroy on creativity. Look at Baumel's stuff on innovation. It's moved direct, very direct, very much so. People all recognize that creativity and entrepreneurship are part of the part and parcel of the market process. Yeah, you can recognize that without adopting any Kruzner, any part of the Kruzneri framework. I guess we should probably let someone else. Yeah, sorry, Jim. Hey, Francisco. You know, uh, a couple questions. Like, I don't know. Some, like just taking on the last point by Professor Bibke. Okay, if mainstream economics is somehow approaching Austrian ideas, who's winning there? And, and, and to, <laughs> Professor, to, Professor Bla, to, to Professor Kaplan, it's like, okay, even if you want to make a point that search theory encompasses <coughs> all this discovery, entrepreneurship theory, well, in the very end, search theory is limited by the, by, by the probability theory has, has limits. You know, there's probability distributions that are not workable or are unknown or there may be like new dim dimensions that come into the analysis. So search theory, just as mathematical models, is, is bounded by, okay, there's limits to mathematical reasoning, there's limits to probability theory, and that's where Austrian economics, where Austrian's point of view may have, uh, may hold some problem, some promise. The problem is that there's pretty much no Austrian who's talking to advanced probability theorists or mathematical theorists who can give them the tools, like, hey, this is where probability theory is weak, this is where mathematical theory is weak, you can exploit these ideas without your subject, uh, subjectivity or, or exploit your imagination here. So that would be my, my criticism to Professor Kaplan. And my final question will be, okay, if you want to assert which of the, of the two points of view this, uh, is more promising, I would like to know, okay, what cases are of mainstream economics, like, how many mainstream economists are there that have switched to Austrians? Now, how many Austrian economics economists have switched, have turned into into the mainstream? If you know, I, I don't know any names of this list. Well, it's an interesting thing. I, I was at a conference last weekend uh, that's on Doug North's new manuscript. Now, Brian will tell you that Doug North is all screwed up, uh, but but nevertheless, Doug North's a Nobel Prize winner and a significant economist in his own right. But that's not what's not what's important, and that is not what Doug North has gone to doing. But uh, uh, how many people have come to, the, to recognize more and more of these views? At this conference, there was very significant scholars like Abner Greif and, and uh, uh, Timur Koran and, and other people who have all tried to incorporate within uh, somewhat of a standard model aspects that come out of or flow out of the Austrian approach, which they self-consciously understand. Okay? Not only that, Vernon Smith is the as he's pointed out, a, a half of his Nobel lecture to why it is that Hayek is the economist who's inspired him to move in the direction he did with his research. So I think that uh, you know um, that uh, there's a lot of uh, movement in, in a direction, and that the worst thing that that Austrian economists can do is to deny completely this movement because for the fear that the closer someone gets to me, the more they represent an enemy to me. Okay, um, and I think that's a that's a that's a mistake. The, the 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 purpose, as I said, of a school of thought to be vibrant, it needs to pollute itself with ideas for wherever they come from. And and the thing that's that's weird about the Austrian school is that that clearly Menger understood that, Mises understood that, Hayek understood that, but the modern American version didn't completely completely understand that because Mises devoted some of his most scathing criticisms to his own teachers and borrowing ideas from other people. So he wasn't worried about making sure he only said what Menger said, right? And, and I think that, uh, um, you know, these are kind of ways in which a school of thought is, is promising is the questions that it makes people ask. 
and I think that the Austrian school is extremely pregnant in that regard. Now, I should say, I should point out that when I read Hayek, I tell all the students that he's pregnant because he's confused, whereas when I read Sen and it's confusing, I tell him he's confused, you know. Uh, so I think that there is a pregnancy in, in the Austrian writers, which sometimes I have a blind eye to other writers um, that, I, that I hope people pick up on and work with. Right, and just to respond to a totally different part of your question, but in terms of improving probability theory, and it's true that you can also add in uncertainty about the number of dimensions, but that's no big theoretical problem. You also have a probability distribution over the number of dimensions. Right? That's also possible. You know, I mean, I, I will say, you, you, I would certainly strongly bet against any Austrian doing anything to improve probability theory, because the complaint isn't that there is a problem with it. It's the whole idea that they don't like. You know, the very idea that you're bringing it in is, is somehow sullying the, the, the great tradition. Can I, uh, can I just say something? Is that really true, or is it just the case that they argue? Because I don't know any Austrian who says people are never maximizing. No. Well, I mean, it both, just depends on the situation which they I mean, have. Both Mises and Rothbard do, do essentially say that, pro that quanti the quantifiable probability can only be applied to games of card, okay, you know, okay. games of chance, cards, dice. So and, and then of course even there when you read when you read more deeply you realize even then it's not any real game of chance because any real game of chance you don't know about the trustworthiness. Of you basically said, I mean you're basically saying well Austrian is just, you know we're using an institutionalist argument and we're moving in a new direction and neoclassical is moving in a new direction but you've really not said anything as to why Austrian should be a different school or why it's a better school. I mean I, I still don't see where even this argument's coming from. I think anyone who asked me that question, right, which is a good question to ask, what you gotta do is you gotta spend time at another environment where economics is being done. And and I did that. Brian's done it, all right? I don't know how the hell Brian did it and has the views that he does, because <laughs> I know no one at Berkeley or, or Princeton that, that, that uh, I might even describe as sensible, except for Ben Bernanke. Uh, but uh, if you're in an environment where other people are thinking in certain ways, you realize that what goes on at George Mason and what you're taught here is far removed from what people refer to when they talk about quote unquote mainstream economics. When you take intermediate micro here, it's the same, see this is the thing that's tricky about Brian. It's the same language and the same techniques. You have an indifference curve, you have budget constraints, you have rationality, you talk about all these things like that. But somehow, if it looks like a duck, it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Brian is an Austrian economist. He's a duck. When, if you put this duck in some other environment, he'd be floundering because the other people around him wouldn't understand what the hell you meant by you know drawing the, 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 the budget constraints certain ways and the indifference curves. All right? Uh, it's, 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 it, we, you know, people in here, even thinking about the application of those tools to political science was considered, eh, eh right? Crazy, right? It was considered crazy to apply those things to things. There's still departments that think that way. And if you go and get the US News and World Report, you know, there's a lot of those departments that are still at the top of those things. All right, we had Gary Becker here uh, uh, a month ago. Gary Becker was asked, how do you keep a department great over time? Well, Gary, and Gary Becker said, well, Chicago ain't great anymore. Why isn't Chicago great anymore? Because it ain't what it used to be in terms of those kind of questions it asked. It's a different place now. And, and so, you know, the economists, think differently in terms of judgment and relevance. There's all kinds of questions outside of the technical tools. It's, it's impossible for any person nowadays to claim that they're an Austrian economist that's not somehow messed up by neoclassical economics in a good way or a bad way because you were all trained to be economists. Otherwise, you're certifiable. I mean, you're like, and everyone thinks I'm insane. No, that's the problem. But unless you went through, because you went through undergrad school, you learned all about intermediate micro, then you go through four years of graduate school in which you're well-versed in mathematics and learning the different tools and techniques, and naturally, you blend those things. It's part of your intellectual milieu, all right? But you think differently than other economists. Austrians ask different questions. That's the main thing. They so, ask different questions. So really, your, your discussion is not a positive difference more than, more than a normative difference. I mean, the things, when you're talking about neoclassical and the Harvard ideal, we start with these assumptions of perfect competition and 
these kind of silly assumptions, really, and that, well, the real world deviates, therefore we need governments. And really, to me, it seems like these people, and the people you're talking about who, who argue about socialism and how it was better, you know, way back in the 30s and the 40s and even up to the 80s, the reason why they came to these conclusions is not because they had these positive arguments and they came to a normative conclusion. They started with a norm of ideology and they justified themselves or rationalized themselves based on their their how they how they manipulated their numbers essentially. I don't I don't want to dominate the thing, but I would argue the exact opposite. And the reason why I argue the opposite is precisely because the way the model sets up, it doesn't highlight the very things that make capitalism work. And so it's very easy for someone to not appreciate capitalism if the model that they are steeped in studying doesn't highlight those things. Like for example, if, if outcomes are independent of whether or not private property rights are in existence. Joseph Stiglitz, who's probably the most, you know, probably the most brilliant economist of his generation, argues in streams of papers that if property rights don't matter, competition does. And my view is that if you don't understand that property rights matter, because your model doesn't highlight that, then you're going to miss certain features of reality. And that's what I would argue this style of thought, this certain style of thought, which we'll, for the sake of the argument we'll call neoclassical economics squared, not neoclassical economics a la Kaplan, but neoclassical economics squared, uh, that, that uh, uh, turns our eyes away from a, a certain institutions which are necessary for the nature of, of capitalism to operate. And that, and the Austrians never wanted you to turn your eye away from it. So in that regard, I think that Austrian economics is essential, but it has to progress. It can't just stay. I mean, I'll disagree, I'll disagree real quickly with my, my professor, with my Israel Kirzner, who I have tremendous respect for more than, than Brian does. But Israel Kirzner says around 1950, 1949, to put it exactly, for those of you on the, in the know, know this, that economics reached its zenith, <laughs> and that since this is how he draws the, the, the graph. Okay? He actually draws it like that. And, and I disagree with that in the sense that knowledge has to progress over time. Okay? Though I do think that this was a significant watershed in, in thought. And that all progress has to build off of that, but I don't think that it, it exhausts our knowledge. Just to uh, respond to a totally different part of that question. So at least my reading of your question was you were saying, well, what exactly is it that we disagree about? Because you're still unsure about this. And I think it's, especially after Pete's reply, it's reasonable to be, uh, to be unclear on it. You know, you know, if I were to, to boil it down to one purity test, I'd say, you know, Pete, you know, do you reject radical uncertainty in all its forms with all its <laughs> problems? And if you say yes, then I go, all right, fine. The debate's over. I'm satisfied. And if you say no, then you've been papering over what I think is, is, is this issue, which while, while highly abstract and seemingly irrelevant, nevertheless, is, you know, leads Austrians off into this uh, direction of you know, lack of progress. Uh, well, no, I think that the, the key you issue, you, I think the key issue like there is, forms yeah, yeah, no, but you, you, you said <laughs> empty promises. Yes. I think you, you, you put it, of course, I reject the empty promises. Everyone, I don't like empty promises. I didn't beat my wife. You, you know, these kind of things. I, I, I don't, I want scientific progress, right? I don't want to have empty it's, promises. It's, it's, it's a joint statement. You, know, yeah. you reject it in all its forms with all, and, and all its empty promises. Not all its force, okay. but all its empty promises. Right, so, and that, so that's where I would say is the disagreement. He doesn't reject it. He still, he still accepts it, although it wasn't part of his talk, but that still is what it no, is. No. It still is eating him up. <laughs> no, it's not eating up. It's over in here and coping with their ignorance. Uh, anything back? Just a question for Professor Kaplan. Uh, if you're talking about probability theory so much, why are you spending all your time trying to convince these Austrians to give up their viewpoints if you don't seem to be having much success? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see. I mean, you know, of course, uh, you, you know, I have a finite amount of time, and I have you know, several different ways I can apply it. Right? And it's, it still seems to be more likely to succeed than many others. Right? In other words, there's many things you can try, even though you don't think you're likely to succeed. I can send papers to the American Economic Review, think I only have a 5% chance of success. Right? As long as the payoff is high enough, I can still do it. Right? And I'd say that, that uh, arguing with Austrians is a very similar, very similar vein. I also, I mean, I haven't been completely unsuccessful. I've gotten, many, I've gotten at least a couple of Austrians to, uh, to back down on radical uncertainty. And so, so I'd say that's, that's, that's the motivation.
you don't you don't even you don't need fifty percent probability in order to make make doing something worthwhile. Well, I guess if you want to go into rattle and medical and certainly I think it really depends on your perception, doesn't it? Because from the point of view of the individual acting within his sphere, radical uncertainty is absurd on its face. Because everything I do, I have some idea of what I'm doing. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. The only time where I can see radical uncertainty makes a lot of sense would be from the point of view of the government or from someone trying to direct something. Because, you know, in the future, I have absolutely no idea what the future is going to look like 50 years from now. And to try to create, uh, and to try to direct policy towards specific goals 50 years from now seems, uh, again, really silly. And so radical uncertainty from the point of view of an institution makes a lot of sense in that the only thing you should be looking for in an institution is to develop a process to make sure that people are working in a, in a right direction from the point of view of exchange and, and rights and so forth. And so in that sense, I can kind of agree with Becky, but from the point of view of, of the individual and of individual entrepreneurs, I agree with you because it doesn't make any sense. You, 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 you put money into things you have an idea about. You don't put money right. into things that's like, oh, wow, I'm totally uncertain. I'll, I'll, I'll pay money for that. that but whoever make... said that? See, this, this is a problem. I mean, I think Brian is wrestling with, like, a straw man here. I mean, because whoever said that you just, like, you know, randomly throw money out there. Now, it, okay, let me, there, is, there isn't a straw man. There, there is actually a real person, GLS Shackle. Right? But Shackle is not necessarily, like, I mean, and he, he was very poetic. And he, he, he recognized the cognitive problem that the individual has, but he has no recognition of the institutions which aid individuals in doing that. A few years ago, I read this book. It's a popular book on probability theory by Bernstein called Against the Gods. I highly recommend it to everyone. Uh, it's a very nice little discussion about that. But what struck me when I was reading it uh, was how relevant it is to actually what Mises was writing about and the economic calculation problem. Because one of the ways that you can think about the way what Mises was trying to say was um, how in the absence of different institutions such as private property in the means of production are individuals going to be able to engage in present value calculations. See, his, his argument, Mises' argument is about the ability of agents to make present value calculations, which is right in Brian's line. And in the absence of those institutions, which puts him far ahead of all of his contemporaries, because all his contemporaries thought you could engage in those present value calculations independent of the institutional environment. And Mises is saying, without this institutional environment, you will not have the knowledge surrogates which are necessary to do the present value calculation. And Bernstein's book is a history of how capitalism is a development of the, of the ability to engage in risk assessment and risk management. Again, right along Brian's lines. So I think there's a way in which, I, I don't see how it is that like, you know, Brian has this caricature and, and, and admittedly some people like Lachman and Shackle push in a certain direction and Kersner to try to maybe create his little market niche or whatever puts in a certain direction. But the idea that somehow agents are sitting there going, you know, Eh, you know, like it's, it's or you know, it's or, or it's all like Forrest Gumpy, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> Wall Street economics is the history of Forrest Gump or something. Um, I don't think that that's that's right. I think that the Mises, for example, was very adamant that he was talking about the ability to engage in risk assessment and risk management, and then without the institutions of capitalism, you know what? You can't do it. Now that claim we can debate about. That's a debatable. That's a hypothesis that we can now chew on. But I, I think that's a, that's that would be a way for us to think about these issues. Yeah, I mean, I, and I would actually say, you know, as I'm, as you know, probably know, I'm no big fan of government. But even there, I'll say, you know, someone who's you know someone who's the dictator of a country has still has some idea about what, what the effects of their policies are going to be. So, for example, when Lenin has all of his opponents shot, I think he is correctly estimating this is going to increase the long-term survival of the regime. He might be wrong. Might be that it turns out that this so alienates people that you wind up uh, you know en ending your term sooner. Like rending your rule sooner, but I think, I think you know, even someone who's running a government, right, nevertheless, you know, when they when they act, they, they have some idea about what's going to happen. And, uh, so you know, I think you know, even in the case of government, I don't think radical uncertainty is really appropriate. Although I'll happily say there's often more uncertainty, right? But that's different for, again from saying it's radical. Or actually, uh, Ted has an answer. Let me ask a question, Brian. Um, if you go, I go back and look at new classical economics. 
I don't really see much institutional stuff in it. I mean, you, you look at, you're automatically at equilibrium, it seems, all the time. Or at least implicitly, you don't worry about how you get there. Isn't, isn't that the benefit of Austrian? I mean, that they come and say, it's not automatic, there's a process. And I don't, I don't think neoclassical economics worried about that, did they? Did they? You know what I say, and I think actually people agree with me, is if you go to the textbook, they'll have a whole account, which is very similar to the Austrian one. People see profit opportunities. They just, don't, they just haven't bothered to put it into the mathematical model. But I, think, you know, that's, I see that as basically sociological, where some things are more publishable than others. Right, and, uh, you know, and that isn't any, something, many things that look good in the textbook, and people will all say, of course that's true, nevertheless can't, you can't get an article out of it, so no one bothers to write it up. So you think they already thought that way, they just didn't write it down? I mean, yeah, you know, I mean, they, they may, you know, it's true they, they don't talk about it as much as Austrians do, but still, I mean, you know, ask any, any mainstream economist, you know, how, you know, how is, it, is it the markets equilibrate? If you have a surplus, what happens? They'll tell you just what people tell you. But, but the problem is that they're more attuned to this, this market failure notion because they don't see the, they don't focus on the adjustment processes. See, it's only, it's, it's, it's here, here, okay, so now I'm going to make an Austrian claim, all right? It's only because of the frictions that markets work, right? It's only because of the imperfections in the world. They're, the only reason why I can walk on this ground is because there's friction between the soles of my feet and the ground. In a world which is frictionless, I fall on my butt. And the Austrians are making a similar claim about the nature of the way markets work. It's only because of the things that neoclassical models in, their, in, in like a stiglitz -y world or an Akerlof world would identify as uh, potential reasons for market failure that markets ever work. Because those are the things that give rise to the arbitrage opportunities and the, and the spur for innovation. And so there is, is, is so it's, it's, uh, that's what I would say. And, and the other thing is sociologically is that, that uh, Brian's right. All neoclassical economists agree to, to a large extent, 90% of issues or whatever, at principles level. Or at some basic level, like do you believe minimum wage or not, or something like that. It's only when you get to the, to the advanced theory that the, the, the divergence becomes farther apart. But you know what? That's what Mises says. Mises says, well, when you want to do baby economics, rely on supply and demand curves. When you need a crutch, you know, when you're teaching like children, how to do economics, do a little math, do a little supply, but when you want to do like real economics, then you have to do this. It's just that he only argued that there was only five people in any generation who could do real economics. Um, and we have a profession which has to supply a bunch of adolescents with economics. That's supposed to annoy you. All right. Uh, Francisco? Yeah, just a question. It seems to me that why it seems to be such a relevant question to ask, okay, who, who made the emphasis on institutions first? Okay, say the Austrians won. They made the emphasis on institutions first. But now there's mainstream people who are also paying attention to institutions. So does it really matter to look back and see who, what, who should be getting credit? Or is it more important to see, okay, who's going to be able to make more progress sooner? Or who is more persuasive? Because sometimes it seems to me that, I don't know, um, I have been in Mason for three or four years. I don't even know if I'm an Austrian or not. Probably not, I haven't taken Professor Bitke courses, but I have been in the seminars. I don't know, but sometimes I get the impression that, that to be a successful Austrian economist, sometimes you can do better coming out with your interesting questions and ideas, but just forget about the label. Will that be a strategy, a strategy that you would recommend? Like just like looking, instead of looking backwards, who, who said things first? Okay, who's going to come out with innovative uh, ideas in the future, or more or more interesting questions in the future. Right. I mean, I, th I think yeah. it very much depends upon what kind of Austrian economics you want to do. If you want to philosophize about radical uncertainty, throwing away the Austrian label is no help. Right? You will just be seen as an unnamed strange thing rather than a named strange thing, and the people who would have considered hiring you won't notice you in the crowd. On the other hand, if you want to add, to add, to ask substantive questions, yeah, then throwing away the label will probably help. Right, so that's purely uh, from, a, from, from the point of view of grad student strategy. There's enough grad students here, or potential grad students, it's worth mentioning. When I, when I first came out of graduate school, I, I think having the Austrian label uh, was a, an advantage to me because it made, me, it, it made other people think I was smarter than what I was, which is that like, when I would make an argument, they could complete it because they'd say, oh yeah, that's something Hayek would say, or that's something Mises would say. And now I actually think the Austrian label is actually a, 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 
a straitjacket to me uh, because whenever I say something that I think is new, people say, oh, well, that's just an Austrian argument. And they read it back into the other one. Now, I do think that Austrian economics is, make, it, you know, is, is capable of making significant progress. And in fact, that the economics profession has moved significantly in our direction. We should take advantage of it. Uh, and I do think that Brian's right that there's a sociology of Austrians, which is sort of a problem that you have to fight against. That is, I'm going to go in the economics profession, never study philosophy, but I'm going to write about epistemology. Uh, I'm going to go into economics and work on the topics that nobody ignores. We can be part of that conversation with him. We already are. Uh, there's other people. And, and we'd be make a mistake if we didn't do it. And so as a result, I try to get a lot of Austrian, young Austrian economists to do things like economic history rather than history of thought. Look out the window. If you can solve a problem that's out the window better than alternative schools of thought, the world will beat a path to your door. If you look out, if you say, oh, I don't want to look at the window, I just want to look at the blackboard and study the genealogy of a, of a bunch of old ideas. No, you know, people have a right. I mean, you could make a living doing that, but people have a right to say, well, what's this have to say about my economics? Uh, yeah, uh, are you, to, to make it clear, are you saying that the Austrian School of Economics then completely hangs on the idea of radical uncertainty? saying that the uh, Ben Key slash Kurzka view does. Right, so there are, there are other, you know, so, so as, as I said, I wanted to apologize in advance to all the anti bet key Austrians right out there, so your views may or may not have been attacked today. Okay. The only you can decide. However, in, in terms of, you, know, you, know, you can really get this out of Kurzner's 1996 Journal of Economic Literature piece, where he actually talks about search theory and gives it enough ground that you realize if he just caved in on radical ignorance, there'd be nothing left. Literally zero. Right, and that screen claim, but I think that's basically true. I, I, I think there's there's one problem. I, I, well, first of all, let me follow up on that. Tyler Cowen, for example, it, outside of this university, he's an Austrian. <laughs> Inside of this university, he's not an Austrian. But anywhere else in the world, he is. I think Brian might have successfully escaped the label, but maybe not. But I think he has, because he's like invested more time in saying he isn't. Uh, but uh, but I, I actually don't think feasibly, you know, that he is. But I think one of the problems is, uh, and, and, and like, I'd like to, Brian's going to think I'm nuts for bringing this up. I, I don't think all this stuff about sheer ignorance and all that stuff is like where you should rest at all, but I do think there's an issue about the notion of error. Genuine error. And even in your own approach of rational stupidity, they're not making an error. It's not an error. It's actually very rational, it's not a, it, it, it's extremely rational for them to engage in the activity that they're engaging in, giving their context. So they're not really making an error. Sure it's an error, they think something that isn't true. That's an error. <laughs> no, but they don't pay any penalty for it, so it's not an error. I mean, but see, you know, a, t a test that doesn't count is still a test. But you can give it, you can give a final exam saying this doesn't count in your grade, nevertheless the wrong answers are still wrong, they're still errors, they're still real errors, genuine errors, just errors that you don't have to pay for. And it's, it's, uh, I, I think that, that this goes back to the gentleman's point before about the path, uh, to Ted's point about the path to equilibrium. Because the issue about entrepreneurial discoveries and the path by which you get from a disequilibrium situation to an equilibrium situation is also one in which is, 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 has problems of errors and the remediation of errors. And there's, there's difficulties in all this. And it seems that we are caught at least, at least in an analytical trap which is highlighted in the path dependency debates between Brian Arthur and Paul David on the one hand who point out that we can get locked in to an error to the uh, Leibowitz and Margolis position which is that if it's a not uh, a remedial error it's not an error and see so the notion of error has always been difficult for economists to deal with George Stigler right not picking up a twenty dollar bill because it's twenty one dollars cost me to bend down to pick it up is not an error Right? I'm not. I'm foregoing that profit opportunity. That's how Stigler would view the world, and it seems to me that, that there is something there that. And I'm not saying now. This is a. Uh, you might say it's a, a uh, not a, a what is it, unpromising, you know, uh, thing or whatever. But it seems to me that if economists could address this issue of error and how individuals cope with error and adjust behaviors in the response to error and error detection and correction mechanisms, that that's actually an advance to our understanding of how markets work. And, and Austrian economists at least are putting that question on the table if they don't have an answer to it. 
So then, are you getting at that with a rational stupidity case where um, you're debating the point of an error? There's not necessarily an error, but someone who is a victim of a, a poor institutional framing. And is the difference there? And the, the rational stupidity. That's how I would understand what Brian's arguing, but maybe I'm, I misunderstand his argument. Okay. I mean, but that's how I would understand it. That that it, it's similar to Stigler's 21. In that institutional environment, for me to correct my belief would cost me $21, and the benefit is only $20. So why should I correct my belief? It's not an error. Right, and, I, and, I, and there I really do think that neoclassical economists in general will say, well, of course we talk about error, and they're correct. Right, so you, you have a rational expectations model, right? There's error in there. However, you say, no, no, that's not error. That's not real error. It's not genuine error. Error, you know, genuine error is error plus something else. Right, and the plus uh, is something very ephemeral. I don't, I don't want to go down it, but I, I mean, I think that it's important to look at Franklin Fisher's stuff on uh, on the disequilibrium foundations of equilibrium economics and the role that error plays and the constraints error has to have formally in order to get convergence to an equilibrium. Uh, I mean, I think it, I think it, I don't want to go down this path, but I think it's a big issue, and I think most of us just punt on it. We say, oh, well, that's too hard. Screw it. And we go on. And that's okay for most to think, but on a technical issue of how it is that a market actually clears, I think we have to come to grips with these things. And if market clearing is essential to the defense of a free society, right, you have to answer that question to get to the defense of the free society. So, yeah, I, I'm, you know, maybe I'm nutty about that. I'm not nutty about always putting sheer in front of words. A radical in front of work. I'm not that attached to the adverbs or whatever. Hello, uh, Doug. Right. Thank you, Ted, one more time. In terms of your response to him, you were saying that, well, economists sort of know this. They don't, you know, neoclassicals don't play up these factors so much as uh, Austrians do, but they still know about it and it's in the background. Well, that's true for some, but it's not true for a lot of neoclassical economists. As you well know, there was a huge debate between Harvard and Chicago over advertising as whether it's a process by which we inform consumers, so on and so forth, and information gets disseminated, or if it's waste or perhaps anti-competitive establishing monopoly. And you know, there are some economists who have learned from Teltzer and Benham and Stigler and, realize, and have that in the background and realize that it is a worthwhile process. Austrians never forgot that because they were always focused on the process rather than doing optimization problems and looking at the end state. But there are still a lot of neoclassical economists you know, out, you know, outside of the Chicago influence who claim that this and a number of other processes besides advertising are way, either wasteful or anti-competitive and it's easier for them to do that because you're constantly doing constrained optimization, looking at these equilibria, and not really thinking through the processes that Austrians never forget about because they never stop looking at it and never stop thinking about it. So. Yeah, well, that's, I mean, I'll, I'll say that's perfectly true. As long, you know, and it is, it's quite true. There are plenty of neoclassical economists who don't really understand their own theory very well. On the other hand, of course, there's plenty of Austrians who don't understand a lot of Austrian stuff. I wouldn't say that, it, that it's that, which uh, Pete seems to be completely in agreement with, so I'll, I'll defer to him on that. Right, so I mean, just to say, yes, you know, uh, half of the people who adopt the label don't understand some big parts of it. And, you know, that's life. That's the way the world works, unfortunately. I think Brian and I have the same thing. There's an overlap. What he calls Austria, uh, what he calls neoclassical economics correctly understood is sneakingly close to what I would call Austrian economics correctly understood. <laughs> and so except for slight nuanced differences. So that's why we can agree. That's why I'm only one point off on his test. <laughs> However, we do know other economists who were trained at very good schools who took that test and scored wildly wrong. <laughs> Less than 50%, right? Sure. You know, and those it's questions... It's a normative test. No well, but it's based on judgment issues which come out of our understanding of economics. Not partly. I'd say a lot more. See, I think that you see. I think Brian doesn't think economics is necessary to ca carry the lion's share of the defense of a libertarian economics. That doesn't sound like economics. <laughs> no, all right. That's because you think all the philosophers are worse than the economists. But but if the if the defense of a free society turns on our understanding of the nature of markets, you know, and and all these things, then I think our understanding of answering your questions about public policy. See, one of the things that's a virtue, someone asked me about Austrian economics, you know, one of the things about it's a virtue about Austrian economists, they never thought policy relevance was a vice. All right? 
uh, when I when I taught at New York University, an economist who who uh, um, uh, uh, this guy Benabou, who teaches at Princeton now, okay, Roland Benabou, the big guy, I, he argued that undergraduates should never be told to engage in a public policy relevant discussion while they're in school in economics because they don't know enough economics yet. Now what did he mean by knowing enough economics? Brian and I would admit that unless you have some knowledge of economics, you know, you should maybe be sh shut up, you know. But but uh, um, on some on some of these debates about you know policy, the steel tariff or something like that. But that's not what he meant. He meant you needed to learn these advanced models about why it is that any uh, you know uh, egalitarian distribution is the fundamental for like living a nice life or something. And and you had to learn that, and you had to learn it mathematically. Then you could talk about policy. All right. That's the attitude of a lot of economists. That's not just the economists that in one particular department. That's the attitude of a lot of economists. That policy relevance is a vice. If you're a policy relevant, that means you're a hack. And what I would, and Brian, I think would agree with this. If you're policy relevant, you're doing good economics. And Austrians were one of the ones. Chicago, the old Chicago school, was one of the ones that pushed that. And I think that's that that's important. That, that strikes me a lot, though. Of, 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 you're not understanding it. Theory, because how can you talk about market failure and subsequent government intervention of market failure without getting into policy relevance? I mean, as soon as you, as soon as, as soon as you, you, you go up to like your your upper right hand and you say, I accept the idea that markets fail. There's almost a very there's this especially this is especially true in the '40s when these people were talking about this. This okay, markets fail, therefore government. Mm -hmm. And so as soon as you accept that, then you're already policy relevant, aren't you? I mean, how can you, how do you, how, how can you? Well, except that you shouldn't be so silly to come down from the high theory and actually talk about policies. You yeah. have to discuss details. Yeah. I think we're, we're out of time. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's so, one, one more question in the back, and I'll, I will not answer it. I'll let Brian answer it. Uh, this is really not technical, but um, you guys talk about mainstream and uh, not mainstream, and uh, I just want to know why the hell aren't you mainstream, and how do you get there? I don't know. <laughs> 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 That's a surprise. See, a genuine surprise. Uh, I would, uh, if, you, if you want a simple explanation, you know, mainstream economists are economists at top twenty departments, uh, statistically speaking. And, you know, as to you know why not be one, I, you know, I can say I'm closer to being one than Pete. So you know, as to why why not be one completely? Because I think they're wrong on some things. So. Well, well, I'm, I'm more asking about the ideas. Like, why are the ideas not mainstream? That's what I'm talking about. Your opinion on that? I mean, they're obviously empirically viable. I mean, the discussions don't hinge on whether or not they're right. Yeah. Well, I mean, the optimistic version is that I, my articles have recently been published. The uh, realistic version is, very hard to persuade people of anything, whatever, whatever belief they have uh, tends to stay for a long time. So we kept you okay. Time out. Thanks a lot to the economics. Thank you for coming out. And thank you. On behalf of the recently formed or revised Germany's Economics Department, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out today. So Dr. Beth Dr. Oh yeah. Misha. Let's make an announcement about Brian's article. If you want to come uh, reduce the weight of my... Of my uh, Sorry. Um, uh, uh, Wow. So we have the power of the professors driving people there. What is it?